So just like Swiss trains, the probability sessions uh, is on time, and we start uh, uh, our second uh, lecture of this afternoon. And it's my pleasure to leave the floor to Paul Bourgade from uh, the Courant Institute, and he's going to tell us about random man matrices. Paul. Thank you very much, Mandeline, for the introduction. It's a great honor and a pleasure to be here. Um, I will talk about random matrix theory, which explains a lot of progress in, on the mathematical side in the past 10 years. Um, but from a slightly different perspective, in the sense that geometry would matter. Uh, classical random matrix theory, as we know it, is uh, a mean field uh, model. You take a big matrix and you fill all of the entries at random. Um, but on these slides here, what you see is, for example, in dimension three, that I will um, say that um, vertex only interacts with uh, other vertices up to some distance, uh, which I will call W, this parameter W here. And this is a very good model for, uh, of random Schrodinger type. And uh, the question will be about spectral properties and the localization or delocalization of eigenvectors. Um, so the question makes sense in dimension one, two, three, and most results I will mention are in dimension one, um, but I will also say a few things about that other dimension. So of course, for the model I just described, um, there are two trivial cases or at least one trivial case, which is for diagonal matrix, then the system has obviously localized eigenstates, and uh, on the microscopy scale, when you zoom in, you see a Poisson point process for the eigenvalues. Uh, on the other hand, when um, you go to the mean field limit, when W is n over 2, you end up with a Gaussian orthogonal ensemble when the entries have a, are ga independent Gaussians with a specific profile. and. Um, very well-known properties for this Gaussian orthogonal ensemble are known. The first one by Wigner is the semicircle law, as n goes to infinity. Uh, namely, the eigenvalues after a proper renormalization uh, go to, the histogram of eigenvalues goes to this semicircle distribution, square root of 4 minus e square. If we zoom on some region of the spectrum in the bulk, by a factor n, we get to the microscopic scale. Actually, we zoom by a factor n times the density of states around E to get a, an intensity one for a point process. And it's known since, it has been known since Godin, Meta, and Dyson uh, that the point, this point process converges to a limit which does not depend on E, where we look at, and this is called the sine point process. Um, for eigenvectors, um, things are actually much easier for the Gaussian orthogonal ensembles. This ensemble is designed to be invariant by any orthogonal conjugacy as a measure. And as a consequence, the eigenvectors are uniformly distributed on the sphere. And this is a well-known fact since uh, the start of the 20th century, for example, for the, by the levy borel law, that if you take a uniformly at random point on the sphere and you project it on a given direction, this is Gaussian in the limit of large dimension. Okay. Uh, now, the question of interest to us is what happens in the transition when W is, um, the range of interaction is intermediate. Is there a sharp transition? Are we always localized or delocalized? And things like this. Um, it's best to think about it in dimension one first with uh, this lower left scheme. Um, I'm looking at the symmetric matrix with bandwidth 2W and periodic boundary conditions. Um, so the conjecture here is that something happens for bandwidth square root n. And in particular, it's believed that the eigenstates are typically localized on about W square sites. So there is localization when W is smaller than um, square root n and delocalization when it's greater. Uh, on the spectral side, it's believed that there is a transition from Poisson to Gaussian orthogonal ensemble for the same parameter for the same critical WC. Uh, the plane curve here is a Godin distribution for the orthogonal ensemble, and the dotted curve is, a, is a, the exponential distribution you get from a Poisson point process for the spacing between two successive energy levels. Um, interestingly, this, the transitions occur for very different parameters in dimension two and three. It's supposed to be at just a little bit more than one log n to the one half 
in dimension two and a big O of one in dimension three. Uh, actually, the main goal of my of my talk uh, will be the main message will be if if at the heuristic level you can convince yourself about these exponents, that would already be um, something interesting. Uh, so I will mention some results about the delocalized regime, not up to the transition, but some uh, domain. And I will give heuristics for, for the transition. Okay. So the context for this problem is um, as follows. Uh, it's a very well-known story uh, that um, to understand the energy levels uh, of a specially confined quantum mechanical system, uh, Wigner's universality ID is to get a model for them, because they are just too complicated to calculate in general. And this model is uh, this Gaussian orthogonal ensemble that I just mentioned. Um, so these are the energy levels for uranium-238. And as you can see, the discrepancy between the stable energy levels, which correspond to the peaks, seems much smaller than for a Poisson point process. Um, there are actually three universality classes which should correspond to a different um, symmetry of the underlying Hamiltonian of the quantum mechanical system, and they are described here, but we will only be interested in GOE for the sake of, of concreteness in this talk. So Wigner's universality ID is very hard to be made uh, rigorous. Uh, the main problem um, would be to um, make it clear for at least one deterministic system but there is not even one such system, although it's conjecture that it holds for a wide variety of them. Um, there, I, I love this conjecture by Boigas, Giannoni, and Schmidt, which tells you the following. If you pick a planar domain and you play BR on it, so here is a cardioid and you play BR on it, for example, um, if the classical dynamics for this billiard are chaotic, um, then what you expect is that the energy levels corresponding to eigenstates for the Helmholtz equation uh, will satisfy the GOE spectral statistics. So more precisely, you consider the eigenvalues of the Laplacian on this domain, let's say with the Richelieu boundary condition. The very low is well known and tells you that in dimension two, the number of eigenvalues up to some level lambda grows linearly in lambda. And given this scale, you can try to renormalize the gaps and look at the empirical distribution of these gaps. And here is a, a numerical experiment in that case, which, tell, which gives a curve which is really not far from the GOE. Um, what has been proved for such models is that delocalization holds in average, the so-called quantum ergodicity, but GOE is not known. Um, so this is a bit of a science fiction on the mathematical side, being able to, to prove such things. Uh, it's slightly more reasonable to look at the following geometry-dependent models, a very well-known Anderson model, uh, which is on the lattice z to the d, the discrete Laplacian plus independent potentials on the vertices. Um, so I take a cube on the d here for the sake of concreteness, and we are wondering about depending on the parameter lambda, which is the amplitude of the noise and the dimension, whether the eigenstates will be localized or delocalized. When I say delocalized, I mean they give mass to any macroscopic domain, for example. Um, so localization at high disorder um, has been known for decades, thanks to the work of Hollish and Spencer. There is also the fractional moment method by Enzelman and Molchanov. And for high disorder, for, for when lambda is large, again, in any dimension, the Poisson statistics are known thanks to work of, of Minami. Um, the, the main problem in that field is to exhibit at least one case, one existence result for delocalization and GOE for this model. For example, for small lambda but fixed and d equals 3, um, the conjecture is that there is delocalization. Um, so it happens that the interesting phenomenon for Anderson and the new one at the time was localization, but on the mathematical side, proving delocalization is much harder. Um, and also the Minami result about Poisson statistics follows from some exponential decay of the resolvent for this problem. And we want to understand what is the underlying mechanism for GOE statistics in the delocalized phase. So what we will see is that uh, 
notion of delocalization, quantum unique ergodicity, implies the GOE statistics. Okay, which is the counterpart of, of this Minami picture. Um, so this is a program. Uh, we will first review a little bit of about minfield models universality, because some tools will be imported from there. And then I will mention the results for band matrices. And if I have time, I will say a few words about the proof of the delocalized regime in dimension one and W, which is uh, at least n to the three quarters. So this is not the transition, uh, but this is a, a very non-trivial uh, geometry dependent model. So for mean method models, um, universality has experienced tremendous progress in the past decade, and I will focus on the case of Wigner matrices, um, which are n by n symmetric, and I only impose that the variance of the entries is non-trivial for all of the entries, and let's say the same one over n. Um, and all the higher moments are finite. And the question, for example, is if the HIJs are Bernoulli, do we expect the same microscopic statistics in the limit as for the Gaussian orthogonal ensemble? The answer is yes. There has been uh, a large number of contributions going uh, to this result uh, that are detailed here. Uh, in this talk, what will be most relevant for us is the IED from Erdosh, Line, and Yao that the, for any university class, there is a dynamical proof such things. Um, this kind of result about having a point process of intensity one and universal uh, in the bulk first requires to know something about um, what is the actual density of eigenvalues in uh, any domain, say mesoscopic domain. So these are estimates which are obtained by Green's function estimates and uh, one important result in particular is by Yadosh Yawanian, and tells you that if you consider the quantiles of the semicircle law, then the ordered eigenvalues are extremely close to it, much closer than if there were Poisson distributed, for example. Uh, let me ta say um, a couple of words about the proof of universality from there, uh, especially to enlighten uh, why this fails for band matrices. Um, so the proof is dynamical, it goes by the dyson barra motion. You look at DHT is dBT over square root n, where B is just an array of independent standard Brownian motions. And uh, we take this matrix evolution symmetric. Then the great equation found by Dyson is that the eigenvalues evolution is given by the following equation. So forget about the dyi in blue here, let's just look at x, which are the eigenvalues of this h, um, then each x evolves by a brown motion and the gradient of log logarithmic interaction here, okay, which is a repulsive interaction. Um, once you have this evolution, the question is, is it true that for a small time, I already have GOE um, statistics and there are several ways to convince yourself it's true, uh, one which is particularly efficient is to use a coupling purely probabilistic argument, uh, which goes as follows. Imagine you start with two different initial conditions, this equation, but the same underlying Brown motion driving the equations. So my initial conditions are x0 and y0. For example, y0 could start from a GOE distribution, and it's invariant in time, it's always GOE. Um, then if you take the difference in this equation, of course, because these are strong solutions, the uh, Brown motions just go away and you end up with a non-local parabolic equation for these differences. If you believe about the regularity theory in this case, uh, it will tell you that your equation becomes flat after a little bit of time, and this time is given by the amplitude, the inverse of the amplitude of these BKL coefficients. But BKL, when XK is close to XL, typically will be of size N, and as a consequence, the inverse will be 1 over n. And so for time greater than 1 over n, we expect that locally the delta Ls will become equal because of the smoothing effect of the parabolic equation. So this holder regularity result is actually equivalent to universality. 
Because if I tell you that delta L is equal to delta L plus 1, it means that the gaps between XLs are the same as the gaps between YLs. Okay, so it's a very simple coupling view of, of this problem. It's robust enough to be made low. You don't need to start from a Wigner matrix. Uh, you can start from any initial condition. And if you wait long enough, you will have GOE statistics. So this is actually a robust argument. What is not so robust is a dual point of view of this evolution, which is just looking at the matrix structure, which tells you that on the other hand, for t much smaller than n to the minus 1 half minus epsilon, nothing has changed in the point of view of eigenvalue statistics. There is a little bit of magic here. On the one hand, we reach relaxation. On the other hand, nothing has changed. There is room between these two exponents. Um, this works because we start from a matrix which already looks a lot like a GOE in the sense of the second moments. And if you just make a small argument based on Ito's formula, you will convince yourself only by looking at the matrix itself that on a microscopic scale, the distribution has not changed. But this second step completely fails if you start with a bond matrix because the entries don't have the same variance everywhere. Um, I want to say a few words about eigenvectors because they are uh, key in the quantum Munich ergodicity sense to results about uh, bond matrices in, in my setting here. Um, the eigenvector diversity is less surprising because it's not so exotic to end up with a Gaussian uh, distribution in the limit. Uh, but I want to state the main difference in the proof compared to the eigenvalue statistics. So first of all, you, you, you could use a, an argument which is similar to the density second step argument that I stated before to prove that if the first four moments of your matrix match the Gaussian ones, then the eigenvalues, the eigenvectors, sorry, will have the same distribution. Um, these are works of Nolesian and Taofu. Uh, this is a somehow perturbative regime. This is based on a, on a Lindbergh swapping principle. And uh, you would like to remove these moment matching assumptions uh, to go to an, uh, a non-perturbative setting. So it's true that actually the projections of any eigenvector on any given deterministic direction will be Gaussians. And the same statement holds jointly for several projections, if you want. And again, the, same, the philosophy is similar to what happened for eigenvalues. You first need some a priori estimates on this quantity, what is the good order of magnitude, and then you can prove the distribution. Uh, the good order of magnitude is, again, obtained by Green's function estimates. And this, is, this works by these people. And if your, your UK is normalized in L2, you expect that it's at most n to the minus 1 half plus epsilon. So this is optimal on polynomial scales. Now, if you want to mimic the proof for eigenvalues universality, the second step is very similar. But the first one, it's not clear at all what kind of evolution for eigenvectors and what kind of coupling you're going to use. So we need to know the joint dynamics of eigenvalues and eigenvectors under the dyson brown motion. Uh, it's a remarkable fact by Marie-France Bru that not only the eigenvalues follow an autonomous evolution as Dyson showed, but the eigenvectors conditionally to the eigenvalues trajectory follow evolutions which are guided by independent Brouwer motions. These BKLs are all independent from the BK case. So what you can do to study this equation is to say, okay, we, I will condition on the eigenvalues trajectory, and I will just run independently this evolution on the eigenvectors. Uh, what you see from this evolution is that UK is going to move very fast on the direction UL when the corresponding eigenvalues are very close, as you expect, because if the eigenspace co coincide, you cannot even distinguish them. Um, now, once you have this equation, it's not clear what you can do to prove that UK becomes Gaussian or uniform on the sphere. Um, we have not been able to find a coupling argument. What we do instead is to do a mapping to some random walk in a dynamic random environment. So the way you, one needs to think about it is uh, configuration eta here, for example, on this scheme, eta is equal to 6. Imagine I just choose 6 points 
between 1 and capital N. And to this configuration of six points, I will associate some observable of the eigenvectors, which is as follows. It's a product of the projections on UK to the power twice the number of points at side K. And then I renormalize to, with what we expect to be the limit, which is the expectation of the same thing for Gaussians. The remarkable fact is that this observable, where these ZIKs are time dependent, satisfies again a parabolic equation. With the relaxation of which will tell you exactly that um, this expectation on the top is equal to, to the expectation on the bottom. So that's how you prove that actually uh, all of these projections are Gaussian. Um, so if this works, oh yeah, it works. Here is a simulation of it. So on the top line, you see the eigenvalues of uh, dyson borah motion. And here they are. They are evolving um, in time. Given this trajectory of eigenvalues, you have the generator of a random walk on the set of particles here it's 12 particles, so they are moving on the bottom here, these blue dots. And each configuration corresponds to a moment of the projection, a joint moment of all projections of all eigenvectors. And um, this is exactly moving together with these this blue dots. Okay? But first, first you, you are given this trajectory of eigenvalues. And then on the top you can just move your, uh, run your random work. Okay? Um, okay, so this, this was for mean field models, in some sense, the most natural extension of the GOE statistics, which are Wigner, but this strategy has been very fruitful for three other models, which are completely non-trivial. Um, the first one are matrices where you could imagine that instead of Wigner, you have any mean profile for the entries, and the variance profile could also uh, be arbitrary, except that you want non-trivial randomness on all of the entries. Um, and universality is known in that case, too. Uh, you can also look at random graphs, um, for example, Erdos-Rini or irregular graphs in some very sparse regimes. And you look at the Laplacian on, this, on these graphs, and again, uh, eigenvalue statistics being GOE is not now known, provided that the connectivity is large enough, but like n to the epsilon is enough. Um, another example I really like is this free convolution model. You start with a deterministic diagonal matrix D1, and another deterministic diagonal matrix D2, and you create the addition of D1 and D2, but you rotate randomly D2 by a hard distributed matrix. Um, so you end up with a Hermitian matrix whose spectrum at the microscopic scale is very well known and described by free probability theory as a free addition. For example, if you start with two Dirac's for D1 and D2 for the distribution of eigenvalues, you end up with an arc sine low. Um, but now it's known, thanks to these people, that even the local eigenvalue statistics are given by GOE for this model. The Common point of all of these models relevant for us, they are all mean field. There is randomness everywhere, and we would like to, in to inject geometry. So let me say what is known about bond matrices. So this is a graph we, gra these are graphs we, you have al already seen. For the sake of concreteness, uh, of, to be explicit, let me say what I mean by localized. I will look at sub-exponentially localized um, eigenvectors on some scale L, say. Um, I will say that this occurs if there is a, a subset of coordinates of size atmos L, such that um, the mass outside this subset is, is really negligible. Uh, so remember that we expect uh, length W square in dimension one. And this transition exponent I mentioned, which is square root of n, which is a bit hard to understand now, was first based on numerics at the beginning of the 90s. And then the very first theoretical evidence uh, was obtained by Fyodor and Merlin by what is so-called the supersymmetric method. We will go back to it. And actually, this localization length W square also somehow depends on the distance to the edge of the spectrum. 
And remarkably, Fyodor and Merlin could even predict what is a, the, the localization length depending on the distance to the edge of the spectrum. This model is different from Anderson, but basically it has the same phenomenology and is as rich for the following reasons. There is an analogy between the Anderson model and random ma bound matrices, which is that this corresponds to choosing the bandwidth W as the inverse of the intensity of the noise of the vertex lambda. And then the phenomenology is supposedly exactly the same. Uh, for example, uh, in dimension one, the localization length for Anderson is supposed to be lambda to the minus two. And in dimension two, that's what we expect. And same in the other dimensions. Um, so the, the results that are known for the bound matrices are of four types here, concerning results on the microscopic scale, which is what we are in, interested in. We are interested either in the local eigenvalue statistics or in the individual eigenvectors properties. Um, but on, on greater scales, there's been a lot of progress uh, understanding what, what happens, starting, say, with Bogachev, Molchanov, and Pasteur, who proved that only need the bandwidth to go to infinity to have convergence to the semicircle. Okay, so semicircle is what we need to have in mind all the time for this model. And linear statistics have been studied um, a lot. Um, there are many people who contributed here. Um, thanks to the method of moments. Um, these are hard combinatorics, but you can take moments of your matrix. And this will tell you things about the distribution of linear statistics of the eigenvalues for polynomial test functions, say. Um, so at the microscopic scale, we want to study four classes of results. The first one is about the H behavior. Second one is for a restricted class of random ma bound matrices with some specific Gaussian profile based on the supersymmetry method. And then for general models, we will go to localization and delocalization. So the remarkable result at the edge of the spectrum is by Sasha Sodin, uh, who proved that the random matrix behavior, which is Tracy Widom uh, for GOE, holds provided that the bandwidth is greater than n to the 5 over 6. So this 5 over 6 is very different from the one half we talked about before. It's because I'm at the edge of the spectrum. This is not the typical behavior of, of eigenvectors. But um, this is a, the relevant transition exponent in that case. And he understands exactly what's going on uh, here, because he also knows that for W smaller than this exponent, there is no convergence to Tracy with him. So transition is very well understood there. Another set of results, which uh, I will go very fast on, because there is a lecture uh, by Sherbina uh, later this week uh, about the supersymmetry method in random matrix theory. Uh, but let me just mention that there is transition which is perfectly understood for one set of observables, which are the characteristic polynomials. And uh, the type of specific models I'm, we have in mind here is where you have a bound matrix whose covariance function is given by the inverse of the Laplacian, essentially, plus a constant. So it's not clear here from this writing, but this is a covariance that has decay when you go far from the diagonal, uh, essentially meaning that you have a bound matrix of side of, of width w. If you look at the expectation of the product of determinants um, for this model, then what you have is that on the microscopic scale, when E1 and E2 are uh, microscopically separated, this converges to 1 in the localized regime and sine sine x over x in the delocalized regime. So this is remarkable because it's, a, it's really a, a hint at the transition for the eigenvalue statistics uh, for this specific model, uh, which is of Hermitian type, by the way. Uh, and, uh, but the transition is well understood here. So for the, for the proof technique, I will not say much, but this is based on uh, very non-trivial representation formulas for these observables which are uh, multiple integrals on which you perform a steepest descent. And there has been quite a few other works uh, on, on this, and uh, in particular, uh, Tom Spencer has been uh, initiating these studies about rigorous supersymmetry method. Um, for general models, uh, 
meaning, for example, is that you can imagine to have Bernoulli entries. Um, so remember our initial scheme. We are in dimension one, and I just link. Uh, I have quantum rates which are only for when I'm at distance w, but and I say that these random variables are Bernoulli. Um, then the seminal result is by Schenker in 2009, who proved that if w is much smaller than the n to the one over eight, there is locali localization. So eigenstates will be confined uh, to about the w to the eight uh, sites. That this is one way to express it. And there is a very strong decay of the mass outside of this band, uh, outside of this localization length. This was recently improved to n to the one over seven uh, by Pellet, Schenker, Shamis, and Sodin. And the, the strange fact here is that actually the Poisson eigenvalues are still not known. They are known for, um, by Minami for the Anderson model, but for the band matrix, it's not clear. The main focus from now will be on delocalization for general models, uh, which is our motivation given the fact that there, is no, there are no results at all for the, for the Anderson model. Um, it has been known thanks to an advanced analysis of the resolvent that if W is large enough, there is um, delocalization in some average sense, meaning that W is greater than n to the 7 over 9. Actually, the fraction of eigenvectors which are localized on less than all sites vanishes as n goes to infinity. So basically, all of the eigenstates, except possible, some possible fraction, will be delocalized in that case, which means that there is a possibility for transport. Um, so these types of results do not uh, cover uh, GOE statistics, for example, and there is a, this work from this year with Yao and Yen, which says that we can uh, get as low as n to the three quarters, and then basically everything is known. And uh, this, I state the results for GOE. Uh, this could be true also and proved for the Hermitian class. So universality is known. Remember that we have in always a semicircle distribution, and I rescale my point process in the microscopic limit. We have convergence to the same process. The localization is known. Uh, the subnorm of any single eigenstate uh, in the bulk will be at most n to the minus one half plus epsilon with uh, overwhelming probability. And uh, most importantly for the proof technique, actually, there is this so-called quantum unique ergodicity, which is true, which tells you that not only the maximum of your eigenstate is going to be small, but the mass given to any subregions is what you expect. Uh, one way to formalize it is no matter which interval in 1n you take of length at least w, the bandwidth, then the mass given by the L2 norm of the eigenvector on this interval is what you expect, modulo some error which is of much smaller size. So this is a probabilistic version of quantum unique ergodicity that we will go and talk a little bit about. And this was proved uh, initially for W, this set of results was initially proved for W greater than a small constant times n in work with Erdos, um, where some method called Milfield reduction was introduced. So what is this quantum unique ergodicity? So this is a very long story, and I, I, will, I will state a simple version here. Um, for us, it will be the main mechanism for getting Gaussian orthogonal ensemble statistics. Uh, for Rennick and Sarnak, this is the following conjecture, uh, that if you take a compact manifold, Riemannian, with negative, with, which is negatively curved, and you look at the Laplace eigenfunctions for the Laplace Beltorami, um, then the mass given by eigenstates, when you go in the semi-classical limit, converges to the mass given by the the Riemannian measure, no matter which subs reasonable subset A you have for, for your manifold. So this is known in some settings, um, an arithmetic setting, and more general cases, much more general cases actually are known in some average sense, which we call quantum ergodicity, um, and also on re random regular graphs, which are deterministic and also just an assumption on the, on the spectral uh, radius um, 
uh, of these graphs, you, you have this quantum ergodicity. So uh, in the remaining 10 minutes, what I want to do is to give a, a little bit of hints for the proof of this result, and in particular convince you that quantum unique ergodicity is a nice notion for, the, for these problems. Um, we will first see that quantum unique ergodicity, in fact, implies OE. Then we will, I will give you heuristics about why quantum unique ergodicity and a model based on the Gaussian free field allows to predict the thresholds in any dimension. And finally, I will mention why, how you get quantum unique ergodicity. Well, you get it from quantum ergodicity and a little bit of noise given by the Dyson Brown motion. Okay, so let's consider a bit about this quantum um, unique ergodicity. First, let's, let's understand why this is important to get GOE. So we start with a band matrix of this type. So A is of size W by W. This is a block decomposition. And um, B is essentially sparse. And that's one way to express my band matrix. I isolate this corner. And just by a short complement, if I have an eigenvalue and I have an eigenvector lambda j psi j for my band matrix, I also have the following equation when I restrict the dimension, which is that if you denote Q index E A minus B star D minus E minus 1B, uh, then WJ, the first W coordinates of my eigenvectors, are exactly the eigenvector for Q index lambda j. So the problem here is that lambda j is very implicit, right? It appears in the operator itself. Um, but let's try to see if we can do something with this. So if I look at the derivative of my eigenvalues of QE, when I just perturb this parameter E, what you actually obtain is that this is essentially the ratio of L2 norms between the last coordinates of Psi J and the first W coordinates. So this is just a perturbation formula. So in particular, imagine you have quantum unique ergodicity for your eigenvector. What it implies is that this ratio will be constant. The L2 norms are known at, at leaning order, so the slope will be known for all eigenvalues if, if the eigenvectors are flat. But this implies GOE, because if, you, if this is a graph for the eigenvalues of QE depending on E. Of course, there are some singularities when E crosses an eigenvalue of D. But if you zoom in some region around the diagonal, what you will see actually in an, in an experimental way is that these slopes are constant because of the reason I mentioned, because if Q, QE is true, the slopes are constant. But for Q index E for fixed E, this is actually a mean field model because A is W by W and uh, there are tools the dyson Brown motion approach was, was adapted to get universality and GOE for this guy. So then by parallel projection, you just get GOE for, for your band matrix. Okay, so it's a very uh, simple ID called Milfeed reduction. Um, but now it's not clear you can implement it. But before going to that, let me state a few things about the exponents. Okay. Um, Imagine, I, I want to understand this uh, last line here, that the threshold is log n to the one half in dimension two and one in dimension three. Um, imagine that QUE, uh, let's, let's consider dimension one first. Imagine that QUE holds for all, all of these mean field matrices, matrices QE. Then I can obtain QUE for the big mat bound matrix by doing a patching. The way it goes is, if it's true for my mean field block, what it really means is that the first W over two entries of my eigenvector have the same mass as the next W over two eigenvalues of my eigenvector. This pi is a projection on the set of indices. Okay. But now I can just patch these estimates when I shift my interval by W over two many times, and over W times. And this will tell you that phi is, this psi is completely flat uh, provided that you choose different blocks in your short complement. The kind of error you'll get in this way is as follows. Each error in this equality here, you, what you can hope for is 1 over square root w. This is a central limit 
theorem type. But then you add n over w of them. So if you are in a diffusive scale, it's square root of n over w times 1 over square root of w errors that you get. If you want to know QUE for the big vector, what it means is that the sum of these errors needs to be much smaller than 1. And this is exactly the condition w is much greater than n to the 1 half. Okay? So now, it's more fun to do it in, in higher dimension. Um, what is the corresponding thing? You, you have your, your big hypercube, uh, 1n, your big cube in, in dimension 3, say, and you divide it in uh, cubes of size w, smaller cubes. And you look at the mass given by your eigenvector on these small cubes. You call them xv. Okay. Let's try to find a good probabilistic model for xv. So xv, what this mean field reduction uh, method tells is that on adjacent cubes, we expect to have the same mass modulo some natural fluctuations of Gaussian type, this good scale being uh, this factor, and this is something easy to get convinced about. But also, the, the, the error between two adjacent cells need, of course, along any loop, vanish. So if you have all of these Gaussian increments on edges of, uh, of ZD, but the sum is along any loop, this is exactly the Gaussian free field. Okay, so a good model is the Gaussian free field here, but then QUE needs to be correct when you identify at leading order what the mass is, which means that the standard deviation of your XV needs to be smaller than its expectation. But for this Gaussian free field model, this gives exactly log n to the one half in dimension two and order one in dimension three. It's very hard to make this extra rigorous. That's why we only go to the, the I'm sorry, I cannot hear from here. Let's defer the question to. Um, okay, so I'm almost on time. Now I want to I want to uh, to explain how do can you get this quantum Munich ergodicity, the flat eigenvectors, from an average version of it. Um, so here is a lemma that we are using here. We assume that we have some estimates. Well, this Q is any matrix. Imagine it's any any uh, symmetric matrix. And assume that you have a good estimate on the average of the diagonal entries of the resolvent, but on a restricted set of the diagonal entries, which you compare to the average of the whole set, which is a trace. And assume that this difference is smaller than, say, n to the minus alpha, provided that your imaginary part of z is greater than another threshold n to the minus beta. So this is exactly a quantum ergodicity type of because if you take the imaginary part, this tells you some average mass over eigenvectors um, is well known and given by the, the trace. Um, then what is fun here is uh, you, you run your dyson brown motion, and if, you, if the time you run it is large enough compared to this, threshold, this n to the minus beta factor here, then individual eigenvectors have become flat the sense which is written exactly here. So all of them satisfy these this estimates with the same error term as what you had on average. Of course, you cannot beat the initial error term, the average. And um, this is um, a fact that adding isotropic noise transforms this quantum ergodicity into, uh, into a quantum unique one. Um, this um, I, on the next slide, I will explain how you prove this. Um, but I must mention that this initial estimate in our particular case is very hard to obtain. And this is obtained by a, a very detailed analysis of the general, of some, something we call the generalized Green's function. And uh, for this, actually, Young has been helping us. And um, so how do you go from quantum ergodicity to quantum unique ergodicity for this, 
for, for, for this uh, Dyson Bra motion type. So uh, at some point, we need a, an algebraic fact, uh, which is here, which goes as follows. We are interested in, in this overlaps PII, which is the mass given by eigenvector UI minus what you expect. So PII is what we are interested in. Okay. We will find a set of equations satisfied by PII in a dynamic way when dyson Brown motion evolves. Um, but for this set to be closed, I need to introduce um, PIJ, which are the partial overlaps when I consider different eigenvectors. And then I construct, I construct the following thing. Uh, remember that for the eigenvector random walk in random environment uh, picture that I had before, I introduced space of configurations like this. Now I complexify it in the following manner. I double the number of vertices on each side, and then I consider one perfect matching. Okay. Here is one. And to each perfect matching like this, I can associate a polynomial in the overlaps, which corresponds to the product of the overlaps between eigenvectors corresponding to the extremes of each edge. OK? So this is P of G for a perfect matching G. And then you average, you take the expectation of all of this P of G over all possible perfect matchings for one given configuration. You divide by a factor. And it happens that this new observable here also satisfies the exact same equation as before. Um, that's something you need to prove, and it works. There is no excellent conceptual expla explanation for that. But, um, but now this, this encodes exactly the moments of what we are interested in which are the PIIs, and we can prove relaxation of this equation, and it means quantum unique ergodicity. So I'm almost done. So the, um, the messages uh, from this talk are as follows. That for mean field models, um, the conceptual picture is, is rather clear for universality, and each model has their own difficulties, but at least um, there is a good, a good understanding uh, of, of what are the reasons for, for universality? When you go beyond mean fields um, for W graders and n to the three quarters, now there is at least one model for which we know GOE. So I explained it in dimension one. Truth is that this works in some very sparse regimes too for dimension two and three. But when I say it's very sparse, it's W merge graders and n to the one minus kappa, where this kappa you can take one over 100, say. Um, but this is not fully satisfactory yet because these are not estimates which are depending on the dimension. But even in dimension three, there are some very short range models for which there is the localization. Um, the mechanism is that quantum unique ergodicity gives GOE, just in the same way as localization was giving uh, Poisson statistics by the Minami estimates. And for the proof, um, even though these are universality results, what we really need are somehow integrable dynamics. We exhibit observables which satisfy a nice equation. Um, the big question um, beyond going to the critical exponents are, of course, whether you can prove something like Bobby Gass, Jan, and Schmidt. Is there one deterministic setting for which GOE statistics could appear? We don't know. So thank you very much, Paul. Um, we're a bit less under time pressure because there's a coffee break now, so we have a bit more... Uh, I mean, there is time for one or two questions. So there was already one. So maybe you can. Uh... Oh, in dimension greater than three. Yeah. Oh, okay. So if you this Gaussian free field picture, uh, then the fluctuations should be even smaller. So dimension greater uh, should are not really the interesting ones for here, right? Uh, but, but so there are no results uh, about it, but um, this picture should still hold. Anisotropic. Oh. 
he's asking about anisotropy. Oh, okay. Um, so, yeah, I don't have, I don't have, um, we don't have results in this direction, and I'm not aware about results in this direction for bound matrices. So I prefer not to make speculations. Yeah. Uh, there's one more question in the back. Maybe the last one. Well, you mentioned this uh, uh, result of Sashnikov, where you have like for a very wide uh, band, you have uh, this threshold of n to the power five over six, right? So. Uh, when you are like above that, you have trace freedom. What happens below that? Is it just known that there is nothing, or is there some sort of universality class that emerges over there? Yeah, I've not understood, understood everything. Uh, sorry for because this. Yeah, I can just try sound, But you uh, let just tell me if you if I understand correctly. You are asking about how natural is this uh, n to the five over six exponent? No, I'm asking whether it's known if there is a distribution that emerges below that threshold. Or if just there is no universality at all. Oh, what happens along the threshold is uh, is uh, th there are no explicit point processes that are conjectured to um, to describe what happens. Um, so may it be at the edge or in the bulk when you are exactly at a constant time sent to the one half in the bulk, for example. Uh, what exactly set of point processes interpolates between GOE and Poisson? Uh, I don't, I'm not sure people have a good candidate. Okay, so thank you very much, Paul. So let's give him another round of applause.